Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about macrotophagy and fasting. So in a previous lesson we talked about macrotophagy and how macrotophagy occurs, but today we're going to talk about how fasting actually regulates and activates macrotophagy. So to begin, just for a brief review, macrotophagy is bulk degradation via autophagosomes and the degradation of the cellular components occurs within the lysosome. Now, macrotophagy is responsible for recycling nutrient substrates and why it's important during fasting is that macrotophagy in the process of recycling nutrient substrates can actually generate ATP energy by rerouting some of these nutrient substrates to the mitochondria for ATP generation. Now, as I've mentioned, fasting activates macrotophagy and it also has other effects. It also inhibits protein synthesis and, and we'll talk about how and why that is in a moment. And there is a chronological activation in protein degradation systems. So during fasting, some of the first things that happens is that the proteasome, we haven't talked about the proteasome, but the proteasome becomes activated um, and that's usually um, very acute activation and then within a few hours macrotophagy becomes activated but as the fasting or starvation becomes prolonged chaperone mediated autophagy becomes activated and we see chaperone mediated autophagy become more important as a degradative process in later uh, starvation. So here is the macrotophagy pathway and we'll briefly take a review of the pathway. So when macrotophagy is activated, a preautophagosome buds off of the endoplasmic reticulum and this all occurs with the help of an initiating complex that involves a protein known as OLK1. Now the next steps involve a, a nucleation process. There is a, a process whereby OLK1 actually phosphorylates and activates Becklin-1 and there is another complex which is not shown here which actually is a, a PI3K complex that actually induces the formation of PIP3 or phosphoinositol triphosphate. The increasing concentration of PIP3 lead to the recruitment of WIPI proteins and these WIPI proteins actually lead to the recruitment of other proteins such as P62 and MBR1 which are cargo receptors. Now there is also an important microtubule protein known as LC3 which is processed via the ATG or autophagy related gene 4 which uh, processes LC3 to LC31. So LC31 is actually lipidated with phosphoethanolamine or PE to form LC32 and all of this leads to the elongation and maturation of the autophagosome and then the autophagosome is carried along, it fuses with the lysosome to form an autolysosome depositing the cargo into the lysosome where it's degraded with cathepsins. Now I've talked about another complex of proteins on the lysosome which is involved in regulating the lysosome and these include a VATPase which is a hydrogen ion pump and there are other proteins, regulator, RAGs, all of these proteins act as a signaling hub to relay the nutrient status of the cell to other proteins known as mTOR complex 1. Now when the cell is in a fed state, mTOR complex 1 is activated and if you need more review on why, please check out my mTOR signaling pathway videos. So when mTOR complex 1 is activated, it phosphorylates and inhibits OLK1. Now on top of that, if there's insulin present, and insulin um, is typically present during a fed state, insulin activates AKT, which indirectly via a couple of different proteins activates mTOR complex 1. So when mTOR complex 1 is activated, it not only inhibits OLK1, but it also phosphorylates and inhibits transcription factor EB or TFEB, which is the mass regulator of lysosomal biogenesis. Now additionally, when the cell is in a fed state, there are other transcriptional repressors within the nucleus of the cell, and these include ZAXGAN3 and FXR. These are transcriptional repressors of autophagy. They inhibit the transcriptional activation of autophagy. And as we've mentioned before, when the cell is in a fed state, TVB is phosphorylated and this prohibits TVB from entering the nucleus. Now when the cell is in a fasting state, when the supply of energy substrates begins to decrease, we all know that AMP begins to increase. So once the cell begins to run out of ATP, 
AMP becomes increased. And when AMP gets increased, it actually activates AMP activated protein kinase or AMPK. And when AMPK is activated, AMPK actually phosphorylates and activates ALK1. Now AMPK not only activates ALK1, but it also inhibits mTOR complex 1. So it will activate the, the initiation process of macrotophagy, but also inhibit the inhibitor of autophagy as well, mTOR complex 1. Now looking to the right of this diagram, when we see that AMPK inhibits mTOR complex 1, this means that the inhibition uh, that mTOR complex 1 has on TVB becomes relieved. So when AMPK inhibits mTOR complex 1, mTOR complex 1's ability to inhibit TVB is lost. Now, there are other processes that occur during fasting within the lysosome itself. And one of the interesting things that happens is that calcium from the lysosome is actually released during fasting. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, calcium released from the lysosome actually has a particular function in and of itself. And it actually activates a phosphatase known as calcineurin. So why is calcineurin important? Well, if we think about it, if we've had a cell in a fed state and it has TVB with a phosphate group attached to it, how do we get rid of that phosphate group? Well, the calcineurin does that. And in fact, calcineurin is the phosphatase that actually removes the phosphate group from TVB, which can lead to the activation of TVB. So not only is mTOR complex 1 suppressed in its ability to phosphorylate TVB suppressed. We also have an activation of calcineurin, which is a phosphatase that actually removes a phosphate group from TVB, activating it. Now, during fasting, when we look at the nucleus, there are other things that are going on in the nucleus as well. And in fact, ZAXCAN3 and FXR are, are actually kicked out of the nucleus during fasting. So why is the nuclear removal of ZAXCAN3 and FXR important during fasting? Well, ZAXCAN3 is actually a negative regulator of TVB and when Zaxcan3 is in the nucleus it actually prohibits TVB from binding to TVB's targets. So once we kick out Zaxcan3 from the nucleus TVB does not have a negative regulator within the nucleus. Now on top of that we've learned that the phosphorylation of TVB is removed during fasting. This allows TVB to enter the nucleus and it binds to particular genes with a clear sequence in their promoter region. Now there are a large collection of genes with this clear sequence and they're all part of a larger gene network known as the clear network. And some of these genes include ALK1, Becklin1, P62, and LC3. Now this is only a few of the many genes which TVB activates as part of this clear network. And in fact, TVB activates many, many clear network genes which are related to autophagy and autophagy function. I've mentioned that ZAXCAN3 is a negative regulator of TVB, but what about FXR? Well, FXR is actually a negative transcriptional repressor of PPAR alpha. And when we have kicked out FXR out of the nucleus, PPAR alpha is also able to have its genetic effects. And some of those genetic effects include inducing the expression of ATG3, ATG5, ATG7, Becklin1, ALK1, and actually, in fact, TFEB as well. So when we've kicked out these transcriptional repressors, Zaxan3 and FXR, we allow the transcriptional expression and induction of many autophagy genes, including um, the following again. So PPAR alpha is very important in and of itself because it activates other ATG proteins and it actually induces the expression of TVB, which itself is a master regulator of many of these autophagy proteins. Now there's another transcriptional regulator I want to talk about and it involves a junk June axis. So during starvation, junk becomes activated and actually activates the transcriptional factor June. We don't talk about this much in autophagy, but junk actually activates June, which then can actually translocate into the nucleus and actually induce the expression of a protein known as ANXA2. Now ANXA2 is important for vesicular trafficking and, and actually it increases autophagic trafficking. So it increases the trafficking of many of these autophagosomal processes in macroautophagy.
And all of these effects that I've mentioned in this lesson increase the amount of mature autophagosomes and increase the amount of autolysosomes, all to increase macroautophagy functioning. Now, in summary, during short-term fasting, macrotophagy function is increased. And I've said this before, it's, it's a few hours. So about four hours, you see an activation of macroautophagy. And this leads to an increase in number of autophagosomes and autolysosomes. And it also increases the rate of autophagosomal turnover. Now, I want to mention again that in long-term and prolonged fasting, we begin to see macroautophagy function decrease. And in fact, this is when chaperone-mediated autophagy function actually increases. And this occurs between, um, or primarily after about 12 hours of fasting, we start to see this occur. So we start to see macroautophagy function decrease. Then we start to see chaperone-mediated autophagy function increase. So remember, macroautophagy is a bulk degradative process. So if we think about it, if macrotophagy function is highly activated for long periods of time, we could see that we might actually start losing very important proteins and very important organelles within the cell after a long period of fasting. So that's why the cell has to become selective. After a while, we want to only pick certain things to degrade later on. So chaperone media autophagy becomes very important. And in future lessons, we'll talk more about this. Anyways, guys, this was a lesson on macrotophagy and fasting. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.